kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war. Hang on. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing Thief, released March 27th, 1981. It was written and directed by Michael Mann, based on Frank Hoheimer's novel, The Home Invaders, and released by United Artists. Which seems like an odd title given what happens in this movie. Yeah. Julia Stiles was born the day after this film was released wide in the U.S. Awesome. Happy birthday, Julia Stiles. Prior to Thief, Michael Mann had worked primarily in television as a writer on police programs like Starsky and Hutch and Police Story, which was created by crime author and the Black Marble screenwriter Joseph Wambaugh. Just prior to Thief, Mann created the TV series Vegas, starring Robert Urich, coincidentally the star of this film, would go on to lead the cast of NBC's series Las Vegas for five seasons. The original title was Violent Streets. Apparently the title of the source material The Home Invaders was never considered. According to IMDb Trivia, in addition to Hoheimer's novel, the characters were based on the Hole in the Wall gang run by Mafia Don Anthony Gaspipe Casso, presumably also the original Hole in the Wall gang based on the names of lead characters Frank and Jesse. The character of Frank was loosely based on longtime jewel thief John Santucci, who had just finished a prison sentence and served as a technical advisor on the film, in addition to playing the character of Sergeant Urizzi, one of the dirty cops tailing Frank all over the city. Was he a dirty cop? I guess yes. he's kind of dirty. <laughs> he's specifically <laughs> asking bribes. repeatedly through the movie to be paid off. Michael Mann's first choice for Frank was Jeff Bridges, who was deemed too young by the studio to play a hardened criminal. I tend to agree based on the age we've seen him in yeah, 1980 and 81. but he's so cute. You could put him in anything and I'll be like, yep, he's perfect. Yeah. Well, and he did play a similar, a, a thief type character in uh, with Clint Eastwood, mm -hmm. where he was like taken under his wing. In Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Lightfoot. Yeah. From Chimino director, right? Yep. Al Pacino turned the role down due to scheduling conflicts. And on the way to con, both Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider were considered. As much as I like Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider, I still think James Caan was the better choice yeah. of all those three. I don't know. I think Gene Hackman might have pulled it off. I feel like Gene Hackman and and James Caan were sort of more interchangeable at this moment. Really? Like, given given from the one with Barbara Streisand? Like no, that movie's a piece of shit and I hate it, but, <laughs> yeah, but that has it, nothing to do with who Gene Hackman was at the time. It, I mean, he'd done the conversation already. Yeah. But Popeye Doyle... Oh, no, is that the French Connection? Yeah, that's the French Connection. Okay. I think Popeye Doyle is, is totally, you know, a, a Frank-type character. Initially, the role of Jesse was announced with Rita Taggart in the role. We saw her last as one of Bud Court's hench people in Die Laughing. During the production, Jim Belushi's brother John made regular visits to the set, and the cast and crew were invited back to the Blues Brothers bar that we mentioned in our review of that film. Tangerine Dream's score for the film was nominated for a Razzie. What? That's not that yeah, that's any sense Razzie's at all. Razzie's the worst. We open on a rainy night. In the opening credits, uh, it starts off with like the title "Thief," um, but it has like the copyright info at the and whatnot at the bottom. Yeah. And I'm always curious about what the decision is to include for the that. Year? Well, to include that in the in the beginning. Yeah. Oh sure, Cause, yeah. Because a lot of times, all times of movies we've watched it have the the titles in the openings of the yeah. films, but not always with the copyright. I think yeah. it's an old fashioned thing, and I think that the the directors with more of a retro eye tend to go for that. Well, and and I feel like it is more common in films that don't have ending credits. True. Because they needed to get it in there somewhere. Right. But this sense. film does have full ending credits, including with the copyright again. Yeah. And so I, I just thought it was very strange. That's true. A car pulls out of a parking spot, and James Caan, as Frank, runs up to the car and jumps in the driver's side, taking over the steering wheel. The car drives down a rainy street under a row of street lights with an ethereal score from Tangerine Dream. The camera drops down past several floors of fire escape into a flooded alleyway 
where a gray-haired man, who will learn later is named Joseph, sits in a car listening to a police scanner. Across the alley, Barry, played by Jim Belushi, has a full electrical panel of wires yanked out of a wall in front of him. We cut inside the building where Frank is lifting a large electromagnetic drill and pressing it against the front of a safe. All the safes and safe cracking tools used in the film are authentic and the cast were taught to use them properly. James Caan is actually breaking into a $10,000 safe here in this scene. I was going to say, based on the footage that I was seeing, I'm like, it he looks like he's drilling like there is ac- he's actually drilling mm. and it looks like he's drilling in the safe so i'm i'm impressed that it was actually him and those are real tools it's, yeah it, it makes it look amazing and it's not just real tools they paid for a ten thousand dollar safe for him to destroy for this scene yeah you don't want to screw that one up i was actually a little you do bit- want to screw that one up <laughs> i was actually a little bit bothered by uh you know, I'm like, I, mean, I hope he was doing it right, but I was just like, eh, he, uh, it looks like he could. Maybe you need more oil on that, or or, or something. You don't want to burn <laughs> out the the bit. I... He slowly cranks the drill deeper and deeper into the safe right beside the combination dial. He removes the magnet drill and kneels to look into the hole he's drilled. The camera floats into the hole so we can see the inner workings of the safe. Frank inserts a pick into the hole and taps on it with a mallet to dislodge a gear and the mechanical tumblers all fall into place. Yeah, again, these shots are really awesome. Yeah. It must the have been f- used some sort of like bullet cam type yeah. thing to go For, in there. It's amazing. Nowadays, this would 100% be CG, yeah. but this this insert of this like micro camera into yeah. this hole looks really nice. Well, like, I don't even know how they did that with the camera that small. And, it's, and how you and light it's it well inside. Lit. That's yeah. what I was yeah. going to say. It's really well it, lit. <laughs> and it didn't look like a miniature. No. No, I think I think it was the real deal. It's just incredible the way they did and it. It's weird to say that it's a miniature. Like I guess it would be a mac- macroature. Yeah. Like where they make something oh, it's small. oversized. Oh, yeah. make it seem oversized so they get the camera. Like what we saw in scanners. When yeah, the, yeah, yeah. All the circuit boards are erupting. When he hacks it with his brain. <laughs> Frank pulls open the outer doors of the safe and hammers another spike into a set of inner doors before opening them. A full cabinet of drawers is inside and he rifles through them quickly dumping all of the worthless gold jewelry in search of something more valuable. Outside, Barry is keeping an eye on the electrical modifications, and the lookout, Joseph, in the car is keeping his ear to the police scanner. Frank radios to his friends for an all-clear, and he is invited out of the building. I feel like, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I know it's supposed to be kind of shocking. You're like, why is he doing that? Because he's throwing drawers of jewelry out. Yeah. But I feel like... It's not that much more to carry to, to just, and, and it's not that much more time just to dump that into your bag. Yeah. And considering how much he gets for these like scores, it's it's not that much. It's not as much as I thought it would be. I, I feel like take everything you can get. I think he has an eye for diamonds though. I think he can he can gauge them on his own by looking at them. And I think with precious metals, it's just like I don't even know what this is. I don't. I'm not going to waste the time. But to I feel like out. it's jewelry. It probably also has stones in it. Yeah. That's so I don't know. True. I just I feel like it's like obviously they they're trying to make a point here. Right. That he just steals diamonds. And he and he says that like adamantly later. Right. But I just I you know I'm like why not? It's a, it's a handful of like rings and necklaces. Just take them. Because gold is for losers. That's why. Well, I'm wondering if the diamonds that he's taking haven't been marked in any kind of way and that's why they're in this is identifiable yeah like like i mean mean, you can you can melt gold but but i mean like as far as like other diamonds sure that that he's tossing to a side because he just wants the diamonds that are in these particular drawers yeah um because i mean i don't know if they have like the laser engraving that they have kind of now probably not in the 80s but they still might have some other ways of identifying these diamonds Sure. Lemon juice. You see with a black light. Frank radios to his friends for an all clear and he's invited out of the building. He carries his tools with Barry to the open trunk of the police scanner car and Frank and Barry strip off their coveralls and walk to a second car. They drive across town to a garage where they park the car and switch vehicles again. The next morning, Frank walks along the waterfront and takes a seat next to a homeless fisherman played by blues musician Willie Dixon and offers him a Danish. Together they sit and appreciate the natural beauty of the morning. 
The next day, we see Frank walking across the car lot that he manages. He barks orders to employees about where to park specific vehicles. From his office, Frank makes a phone call to someone, reminding them to stop by the vehicle bureau to pick up transfer titles in his name. Frank heads out to a diner and takes a seat at a booth with a portly, bald, bespectacled man in a vest. He lays out a row of envelopes containing the diamonds he heisted from the safe the night before on the bench between them. This seems like an odd place to do this. Like, I understand, like, you want to meet out in public, but they obviously, and they know Frank here. Because right. They say he wants more coffee, Frank. Um, but to, to like, have him, like, open these envelopes of diamonds, I'd be worried about, like, whoops. Yeah. Like. You drop one, and then it's like, okay, well, we're going to have to unscrew this whole bench seat to figure yeah. out where that went. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I was like, this seems like a very not safe environment to to open up all these precious especially stones. the way they're packaged in these envelopes it's not like a, an envelope where the sides are sealed up oh, yeah it's, a it's just paper it's just folded. a folded piece of paper so <laughs> mm-hmm. it's very easy to just dump them all into the floor frank seems to know what they're worth and he suggests a price tag of five hundred and fifty thousand dollars wholesale but he's willing to take 185 which is about a third the price of the wholesale cost of the diamonds yeah this and this kind of shocked me and i know that it's like you know 1981 money but this many diamonds would go this for that many little. diamonds seems like it should cost a lot more and also the amount of risk and effort that he puts into this i feel like that doesn't seem worth it i think the problem is that he he's getting so good at it that he feels like there's less risk hmm. I, I mean it's also like a range like i mean he he thinks they're worse this, but he'll take this. Like, right. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that this character is Joe Gags. Right. Uh, I'm assuming that this guy will try to get top dollar. Yeah. Um. And and I guess he's giving him some negotiation wiggle room because you know again he's does these scores all the time. It's, yeah. It's the the money isn't that huge of a deal. Uh. But uh. Yeah. The price does seem really low. Uh. But, you know, I don't know. The diamond market is like one of those weird things that I don't quite understand. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I get that, you know, if you're trying to fence something, you're not you're not going to get what it's actually worth. Mm-hmm. But it still seems like he'd want to do, uh, you know, bigger jobs or, you know, work less for more. True. While Gags pulls a calculator out to overthink the price... Frank starts making eyes at the diner cashier. She notices him looking. The man agrees to the price, and he says that they'll make the trade tomorrow at his office because there's some people there who want to meet him, but Frank isn't interested in meeting anyone. What do I want to meet? I want to meet people. I go to a fucking country club. Okay, okay. He tells the man to give his money to Barry at 3 o'clock, and then he moves to pay the bill. At the register, he invites the woman, Jessie, to dinner tonight at 8 p.m., and she accepts. They seem to have some sort of history. Like, she knows who he is, and they're talking to each other like, we've had this conversation before. That's what I thought, but I don't get that feeling later on. But right. doesn't he say something like, oh, that's a nice shirt. Is that a new shirt or something like that? And it's like, you wouldn't say, is that a new well, shirt to they, someone you I think just met? They have a, no, you're right. I think they, they have a history in so much as he goes to this diner, like, every day and sees her. I don't think that they've dated before. Correct. Back in his office, he's sorting through the mail when he sees a letter from the State of Illinois Department of Corrections. He reads the letter, and it was written by an inmate at Joliet named Okla, who's very proud of him and the changes that he's making in his life. He asks for a visit. Do you remember the last time that we dealt with inmates from Joliet Prison? <laughs> I was going to say Joliet Jake. Yeah. And his brother, <laughs> yeah, because we already referenced that his brother's in this movie. Yes. Frank folds the letter in quarters, and then he pulls another folded piece of paper out of his wallet. It's a collage of magazine cutouts, a car, a house, children... A row of skulls. And in the top corner, we see Willie Nelson's face. I guess he's just a big Willie Nelson fan. And he wrote Okla next to it. Frank steps into his bar, a bar that he owns called the Green Mill, which okay, is a real so, bar. So he does own this He place. owns the bar and he owns the car lot. Okay. Diversify. Uh, yeah. The bartender tells him that Barry's been calling for him. And he gives Frank a number to reach Barry at. When he calls Barry, he finds out that the drop went wrong. Joe Gags, the man who he met in the diner, got dropped out of the 12th story of a building with Frank's $185,000. Apparently, he already had the diamonds, I guess? Well, he, I think he gives them to he, him he at the He gave them to restaurant. him there at the diner? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so take this, fence it, bring me my money. Okay. Turns out he'd been skimming money from someone named Ataglia, and he was found out. 
Barry drops Frank off at the L&A Plating Building, the offices of the people who collected Frank's money from gags. Frank tells the secretary there that he needs to see Mr. Ataglia about some unsatisfactory plating that he paid for. He's like, yeah, I got some plating and I didn't like it. Didn't turn out good. <laughs> they let him right in. He picks up the chair in front of Mr. Ataglia's desk and he sets it down right next to Ataglia facing him. He admits that he's not here about plating and he wants his money back, but Ataglia pretends not to know what he's talking about. When the man calls for his security people, Frank yanks him up from behind the desk and puts a gun to his head. One of Ataglia's two guards here is Dennis Farina in his first feature film appearance. Frank makes the two guards lay flat on the ground and informs Mr. Ataglia what a mistake he's making. I am the last guy in the world that you want to fuck with. He gives them three hours to recover his money. Well, then he walks out with his gun still drawn and, and pointing it at the random people who work at this front, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, but they don't seem to either, I don't know if they know that it's a front or they don't, but he's putting him, he's exposing himself Yeah. a lot. Yeah, uh, I didn't expect him to still be holding the gun up in the air as he yeah. walked out of the office. But all five secretaries are freaking out about it. I'm surprised none of them are calling the police already. Yeah, so I, I don't know their level of involvement in yeah. what's going on. Um, That's true. They might know better than to call the police and involve them right. in the business. Frank heads out to Joliet during visiting hours to meet with Okla, who, as I said before, is being played by Willie Nelson. That wasn't just a picture of Willie Nelson. It's, <laughs> that's the guy playing Okla. Uh, Okla fills him in on some jailhouse news. Same old shit. Morris finally busted Red's Pruno operation. A lot of knifing's going on. Yeah. Dope. Yeah, that and sex. You wouldn't believe the quality of people they're putting in here these days. Ten or fifteen years ago, they'd have dumped them in a funny farm somewhere. Okla asks after Frank's wife, and he says that he had to pull the plug on his marriage because she found out he was cheating on her. But it's not clear if she just misinterpreted the time he spends stealing things as him cheating on her, or if he actually did that. I mean, it's it's sounded to me like that's what it was. That she misinterpreted it. Yeah. Th- yeah. That th- th- like he that's how he was explaining it. Because to Okla. he sa- he says, oh she you know she doesn't know that I'm a criminal and rocket scientist that she is thinks I'm out with having dinner with fancy ladies or something like that. Which means he's not, he's just committing crimes. But the way he says it though, is that he says uh, rocket scientist that she is found out I'm having dinner with fancy ladies. Right. But I absolutely a hundred percent take that to me. And he's like, I'm out doing jobs that she doesn't know about. So she assumes that I'm out with ladies. Yeah. He lets Okla know about the new girl, Jessie. The new girl, Jessie. No. Oh. Jessie is on the new girl. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis Farina's on that show, too. That he intends to marry and have kids with, but he's struggling with how to tell her what he does for money, or if he should even tell her at all. Lie to no one. If there's somebody close to you, you're going to run it with a lie. And if they're a stranger, who the fuck are they? You got to lie to. <laughs> somebody who's going to turn you into the yeah, cops? Yeah, if it's the yeah. police, <laughs> lie to them. Frank asks Okla why he requested the visit, and Okla says he needs out fast. The prison doctor has diagnosed him with, quote, angina something something something, end quote, and he won't make it 10 months to the end of his sentence. The buzzer indicates the end of visitation hours, and Frank agrees to get him out as soon as possible. That night, Frank goes to meet up with Mr. Ataglia and the crime boss he represents, Leo, as played by Robert Prosky, an amazing first feature film appearance at the age of 51 this is his yeah. first movie huh. leo introduces himself to frank and is quick to hand over frank's cash the exchange is being watched by a pair of police who are surprised to see a two-inch stack of money changing hands here but it's also being watched by barry who has a gun trained on leo and his men from over the top of a billboard nearby leo thinks some thanks are in order but frank reminds him that it was his money in the first place when frank tries to leave leo suggests they talk business Frank doesn't even know who Leo is until he admits that he was the eventual buyer for the diamonds. I'm the bank. I handle the fence for half this city. You've been putting down two, three scores a month. Month in, month out. I see your stuff. You've got great taste. Regular Highline Pro. The cops watching this interaction still can't figure out who these men are to each other and start shouting at each other confusedly. Who is he? How the hell do I know? Leo presents Frank with a business opportunity a sort of partnership. 
Leo will find scores and give him everything he needs to save him the effort of casing. And they worked up. <clears throat> Alarm system diagrams, blueprints, sometimes a front door key, sometimes the scores are in on it. Everybody's ripping off the insurance company. All the expenses of the job would be provided by Leo. Frank asks what kind of scores they're talking, and Leo says guaranteed 100000 or more. And he says he'll make Frank a millionaire in four months from just his share of the take. Frank explains to Leo that he doesn't steal anything but diamonds, diamonds and cash. Which is, cash is like, like... You're throwing I, gold over your shoulder, but you're going to go for cash? Yeah, ca cash seems like the worst option. Yeah. It's all like traceable serial numbers. Yeah. And... He also says he never does home invasions, even though this movie is based on a book called The Home Invaders. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the meaning of the book is, is that these people are invading his home mm. at the same time as they're people who take things from people. Yeah. Well, and I think that there might, I don't, I'd have to look up the exact definition of a home invasion, but maybe if people are not there, does it count as a home invasion? But none of these places that they rob are homes. Right. Well, it's hard to tell, like, with the opening scene where he uh, is. You have no idea. It reminds me of, uh, that opening bit reminds me of Ant-Man, like, when he's oh, totally. in the basement with the giant safe. I, I think mm -hmm. they were definitely drawing from Thief with a lot of the cinematography for that movie. Even. Yeah. Frank mentions that he has a partner, and Leo says, you got to pay your partner out of your half. That's not my responsibility. Frank wants time to think about it. That night, Frank shows up to his date with Jesse two hours late and invites her out for coffee to explain. But but I didn't know. I was very confused in this scene because I, I didn't remember that this was the girl from the restaurant. Oh, okay. Um, And he's so aggressively trying to get her out yeah. of, of the club and and so to the point where it, it seems like that this I thought this was a different woman because he's only talking to her for a few moments before the bartender comes over with a bat and yeah. I was like oh he's not supposed to be talking to this person and this bartender knows him but because I didn't understand why he was being so unbelievably aggressive I thought it was like his ex wife yeah I he think he's like, being aggressive because he's impatient for his future yeah and he's made all these plans and he's like all right. I get to start my plans right now. I'm going to go settle the wife part. Then I get the kid part. Then I do the car part and the house and the whatever. And so I got to get moving on this. And so he, he goes out of this woman. But she's also probably been complaining to this bartender that this guy didn't show up for two mm. hours. And so the guy knows. And then when he comes in and he starts talking to her, he's like, this is the fucking asshole. And then when he sees him being a little aggressive, he's like already ready for it. Yeah. And uh, future Michael Mann uh, lead actor right, yeah. is the bartender with the bat yep she doesn't want to hear what frank has to say so he picks her up and carries her out of the club when the guy at the bar tries to stop him with a baseball bat he flashes a gun to scare everybody away from him outside he shoves her in a car and she tries to get back out so he grabs her by the forearm and some people on the street actively try to stop him again and he knocks one over with a punch before throwing her in the driver's side of the car and then just pushing her in with his body weight so that he can start the car immediately and drive off down the perpetually wet streets of thief town apparently the production kept a 60,000 gallon water truck on set to wash down all the streets into a reflective sheen for all of these night shots it paid off yeah, yeah it's absolutely it it's, looks great. it's gorgeous as an excuse for showing up so late frank tries to explain how important his job is but she doesn't believe him what the hell do you think that i do come on come on Come on! Every morning I walk in for five months, say hi. What the hell do you think that I do? You sell little fucking cars. That's what you do. I wear $150 slacks. I wear silk shirts. I wear $800 suits. I wear a gold watch. I wear a perfect D flawless three carat ring. <laughs> well, he's so impressed about his ring. Yeah. I change cars like other guys change their fucking shoes. I'm a thief. I've been in prison, all right? A couple of these are less impressive than the <laughs> Yeah. You should have led off with the prison and <laughs> yeah. then worked your way up to thief. <laughs> he mentions that his wife left him recently, and he wants credit for waiting for the end of his marriage to officially ask her on a date. Frank and Jesse take a seat at the booth of a diner, and it's not the diner that, that they were at before. Yeah. This is a new diner. Right. Uh, he asks her what it was like before, her life before what she's doing now, and she says that she made a lot of money traveling from Tucson to Mexico City to Bogota, but things got messy. 
the implication here being that she ran drugs for profit in the past, but that she escaped that life to work as a cashier in a diner here in Chicago. Like, what are the chances that the random woman that you flirt with at the diner is, is, is also just a as criminal? Fucked up as you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And 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 this whole thing of him being super aggressive, she's like, okay, he's just really direct, I guess. Yeah. Now I get up in the morning, I take a shower, I go to work, I have a job, I have a social security card, and my life is very ordinary, very boring, which is good because it's solid. They both like to just make lists of things that they have. <laughs> he asks what happened to the guy who was putting her through all this, and she says he's dead. That is good because he's an asshole. There was a lot of love in the beginning. The guy was an asshole. There was love in the beginning. Big asshole. She asks where he went to prison, and he tells her about his time in Joliet. Apparently, he went in over a matter of $40, and he was supposed to get two years with a parole in six months. And right away, I got into this problem with these two guys. They tried to turn me out. So I picked up uh, nine more on, on a manslaughter beef, some other things. I love how nonchalantly Frank admits that other prisoners tried to prostitute him and he murdered at least one of them. Yeah. <laughs> he went in 20 years old and he came out 31. But he told her you can't concentrate on the time you spend in there because it'll make you crazy and the only way to survive is to not care about time. He goes into more detail on the problems he faced inside. Apparently there was a captain named Morphus who had an organized ring in the prison that would rape younger inmates. Hey, would the... Uh... <coughs> go into these cells and grab these young guys and bring them up to hydrotherapy in the mental ward, uh, gangbang. And if a guy puts up a struggle, they beat him half to death and he winds up in a funny farm. And Anyway, word comes down that I am next. And I do not know what I am supposed to do. I, uh, I am scared. 11, 30, 12, uh, lights come on and, uh, I got this pipe from uh, from plumbing, and uh, I whack the first uh, guard in the shins. And I go through a convict and another convict, and anyway, I get to Morphus and I whack him across the head twice. Boom! <clears throat> and then they jump all over me, do a bunch of things. I spend six months in the hospital ward, but uh, Morphus, he is also fucked up real good. A cerebral hematoma they pension him out and he can't walk straight and he dies two years later which is a real loss to the planet earth after that when they put frank back in gen pop everyone left him alone it seems to me that everybody left him alone because of how much damage he was able to do by himself but he credits his mental attitude the fact that he didn't care about himself or anything james Conn has mentioned this monologue in particular is his favorite thing that he's done outside of the godfather yeah, th this whole scene was was good. Uh, although I would say the only thing that bothered me was the editing. Um, yeah, I feel like if this if this scene was done today, it would have been one take. Hmm. Yeah, I think that would have been good. Uh, it, it the 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 constant back and forth just kind of made kind of broke it up a little bit too much because it made me think it was like okay, he's this is being edited, and we're also chopping up her story so much that I almost can't follow it. Mm-hmm. The whole impetus of the story that he tells about his time in prison came from a letter that director Mann received from an actual inmate who had been through this situation. Frank digs his vision board out of his wallet and he shows it to Jesse. He tells her that these are his plans for the future and that part of it is her. <laughs> and part of him is that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's right in the middle of the... Yeah. Although he's not pointing to the woman that's cut out in the middle of the picture when he shows it to her. He just says like, oh, this part is you. And he's pointing to like the house in the corner. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you just think of her as, as part of home? She's not like a person in your future. She asks who Willie Nelson is. And he tells her that's David <laughs> Okla Bertino. He's a singer. and no. Never heard of him? <laughs> Didn't see Honeysuckle Rose last year? He tells her that's David Okla Bertino a master thief who mentored him in the ways of cracking safes. He refers to him as a father figure, although Willie Nelson is only seven years older than James Gunn. She asked him why the vision board is jam-packed with skulls in one corner, and he tells her that in the real world, people grow and they die, and he wants the ability to do that on the outside. She starts to get worried because there's a lot of kids in this picture, and she admits to him that she can't provide everything in this picture. Uh, I 
can't have children. I don't fit into this. Wow, well, we adopt. It's clear from the fact that she was willing to bring this up that she wants to help him complete the picture. Like this is basically a yes from her that they can try to form a life together. And and she was on the verge of tears because she thought this was going to cause rejection from him. Frank admits to her that he has a line on a shortcut to his end goal and he can make things happen very quickly and they can be out of the business of crime and start a legitimate family. And she's crying tears of happiness as she reaches for his hand. We cut directly to Frank at a payphone calling Leo to accept the business offer. He tells Leo that he wants to make it to the million dollar mark with a couple scores tops. We cut to Frank and Barry on a rooftop with Leo and is it a tag Leo with him again? Uh, That's a different guy. No, there, there's like, there's like a, an another, intermediate. Yeah. yeah. I think this is, it, it might be Joseph. No, Joseph has gray hair. Okay. I, I, I see this guy. Sometimes he's with Leo and sometimes he's not, yeah. you know? It's also like casual Friday. <laughs> yeah. They're all just wearing like really funny pastel colored clothes. And Jim has this like Hawaiian shirt on yeah. that apparently was like a big pain in the ass of the costumer for the show. Like Michael Mann was very insistent on a specific style of Hawaiian shirt for him to wear for this scene. On the top of the building, they're discussing an upcoming job. There's a safe with millions of dollars worth of diamonds and Frank's cut would amount to 830000 Unfortunately... It's a massive Richmond and Lackett vault, and there's also five different alarm systems they need to work their way around. Frank says it'll take four to eight weeks to get all their homework in order. Yeah, they also don't know what the fifth alarm is. Right. They know that they're, they found four, but the fifth one is, is an unknown, but right. they know it's there. They know it's not connected to the phone lines. Yeah. They, I don't think they ever explain why they know there's a fifth one, but you know don't have any yeah other though they do have some it. kind of blueprints to this vault so they i think they have someone on the inside that's feeding them some information i really wanted it's not a spoiler but i really wanted the fifth alarm to just be a really big dog <laughs> 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 it's like well, we found that fifth alarm yeah took care of it real quick just sliced it in half with a flaming torch <laughs> just use one of those meat cutters like yeah. he did in the exterminator <laughs> yeah i was just gonna bring it up <laughs> It seems like Frank is getting some of his payment up front because we cut to a home in the suburbs and he asks Jesse what she thinks of it and she loves it. We see Frank pull into a junkyard where he meets with an older associate named Sam. He tells Sam he needs a favor. Frank shows Sam the blueprints of the vault and he identifies it as a Richmond and Lackett model. Sam's first recommendation is to drill a hole into the lockbox, but these are custom vaults and the lockbox is never in the same place twice. So Frank is looking for a way to cut a completely new door in the vault. Sam is flabbergasted at the request. Frank wants a portable system that gets hot enough to melt through the materials this vault is constructed from. He's so shocked that he calls Frank by his name from a completely different movie. Seven, eight thousand degrees. Portable equipment. There's no other way to do it. No. Sonny, if I can build something, it's going to be a son of a bitch to use. Okay, so is it worth it? It is worth it. Sam tells Frank to come back in a week to see if the tool's ready. What he's asking is crazy to me. Yeah. Like, it's because this is like several inches thick steel. Yeah. You know, multiple layers of steel here. And he's asking for something he can carry into a building to burn through it. And I have no idea how he was planning to do this. Basically, he wants a lightsaber. Yeah. Yeah. Which they deliver, which is crazy. Yeah. But I was just like, I, I conceptually, when he's asking for this, I'm just like, I don't, th- that, that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It does exist. Apparently. <laughs> and I would have known what to do right away because I am a MacGyver expert. You make him a thermite torch. Yeah. That's what <laughs> this is, basically. Yeah. We cut to a courtroom where the attorney Frank hired to plead Oakless case addresses the judge. As the judge and attorney trade boring legalese comments back and forth, they keep resting their faces on their hands, and at first the judge has eight fingers pressed into his cheeks. The attorney wraps four fingers around his face in response and makes the point that Okla suffers from a severe heart condition. The judge meets him halfway with six fingers across his face, and the attorney agrees. Uh, This was uh, my Ghostbusters reference. When, oh sure, yeah. When uh, Venkman keeps looking to Egon for amounts to charge the yeah. hotel, and Egon just keeps putting fingers up to his face. Like, 
$5,000. I had no idea it'd be so much. I won't pay it. That's okay. We can put him right back in there. We certainly can, Dr. Venkman. Um, But I feel like this, the gestures that they're doing back and forth are inappropriately obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone in the whole room can see exactly what they're doing. And there's no way this would be the standard system for this. (laughs) No. But at first, like the first time it happened, I'm like, this is a really weird acting choice. Oh, I get it. Yeah. (laughs) But that's the problem is that. We can get it just from watching it once in the scene. Yeah, where yeah. It's like people that are in this courtroom every day must know one million percent what's going on here. Well, especially when he's doing the when the lawyer's doing the six thousand, and he looks just like he's making like fake Dracula teeth with two yeah. of his fingers because he's got the rest of them up on. His I wanted face. him to do the upside down glasses. Next. <laughs> yeah, it's like what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> For the podcast listeners, I was placing. <laughs> An OK symbol over my eye upside down so the mm-hmm. fingers are pointed down toward my chin. <laughs> it's important that you understand the visual. Outside the courtroom, the attorney tells Frank that it will cost $6,000 to get Okla out of prison, and Frank rounds the payment up to 10000 to thank the attorney for his troubles. Okla will be out of jail in a week. Barry arrives to speak with Frank at his home. They sit down with drinks in his backyard, where Barry announces that he's solved the fifth alarm problem. Alarm system number five. There's a one-channel radio transmitter. How's it triggered? All right, there's a sonic detector off the ceiling. All right, now they set off the alarm every morning when they walk in. Ring, ring, ring. It's tripped. They have 10 seconds to transmit a code word to the alarm company to cancel it. Now, the code word goes over the radio. That's why uh, there's no phone lines. Frank tells Barry to bug the room so they can intercept the code, and they should be fine. We cut to the adoption agency where Frank and Jesse are here to be evaluated on their fitness to adopt a child. The woman processing their application misunderstands Frank's having put Joliet State Penitentiary 1959 to 1976. But so do I, because that's 17 years, and he said he was in for 11. When she understands completely that he's admitting to being a convicted felon, she explains that they clearly don't qualify to adopt. Frank says they aren't picky, and he offers to take any kid they've got, African-American, Asian-American, eight-year-olds, although he doesn't use those exact words. <laughs> yeah. He takes off his D-flawless, three-carat, emerald-cut diamond ring and places it on the woman's desk as if by way of payment. Frank gets more and more upset with the woman until they're escorted out of the building by a security guard. We cut to Frank and Jesse that night sleeping on a chair together in their backyard beside a fire. The next day we see Frank driving along when a pair of police officers pull him over. Frank rolls down his window for the first cop to his door, and he introduces himself as Sergeant Urizzi. Sounds like they didn't stop Frank for any better reason than to pitch some kind of partnership. You know, a very important thing for you to remember is going to be my name, Sergeant Urizzi. Urizzi? Why is that? Because I'm going to do good things for you. What for? Good conduct medal? Uh, I'm here to make life easy for you. Yeah. Smooth out the bumps and the humps. You know, your relationship with us. Yurizzi tries to muscle in for 10% of what Frank makes. But Frank leans on his front that he's just a lowly car salesman. He offers them deals on Buicks, and the second cop starts to lose his patience. He tells them that if they want to arrest him for doing something illegal, they can catch him in the act. But for now, he's a humble car monger. He leaves them standing in the middle of the street like a couple of dummies. At home later, we see Frank taking apart the phone in his kitchen and removing a bug inside it, only to replace it because he realizes that he has to leave it there or else people will know that he found it. Right. He walks Jesse over to the kitchen sink and turns on the water so they can speak in private under the sound of the splashing. Frank says that he'll check the rest of the house, but for now they have to be careful on the phones. I have a question about how phone bugs work. <laughs> yeah. Not like this. <laughs> okay. Usually they tap into the line. Well, that's yeah. what I would have thought because this is like just a like a loose microchip looking thing in, yeah. in the case of the phone. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not in the receiver. It's in like the, the body of the phone. But there's not a connected power but source. But it's not, it. yeah, it's not connected mm-hmm. to any power source. It's not a transmitter. It's not a recording device. I'm just, I guess I'm just confused how, how this works, especially in 1981. Like, yeah. I do feel like... Michael Mann is the kind of person who would want this to look legit. Yeah. Maybe this is how it works. So maybe this is how it works and I'm just not well versed. It seems wrong to me. It seems wrong to me too. But if this is how it works, uh, because it's not tapped into the line and it's not like 
in the receiver of the phone. Mm -hmm. I would think that it's just recording all audio, like a bug, like the, like a general room bug. So I feel like if you if you heard the kind of noises, like somebody were manhandling it and pulling it out and putting it back in and closing it back up, yeah. you'd know that it was found. Well, here's here's <laughs> another thing that I was thinking. Maybe the way it works is that it's like it's like a repeater sort of. So it picks up the electrical signal by proximity and then broadcasts it on a channel that they're recording from outside the house. Uh, Either way, I don't know how it's working. It, it's <laughs> it's not working. This is this is Richard st- doesn't know. This is a stupid 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 thing. <laughs> it's real. Like obviously like they can't tap the phone without a warrant because that it would leave a paper trail, but they could certainly you, even if they just had that microchip but had it connected like two wires coming off of the phone line yeah or off of something off camera yeah where we don't even see where it's plugged yeah in. J- just so i can know that this thing is powered because this thing is not powered and right. this is not a near field uh thing that we have chip that we have now maybe it's bluetooth <laughs> <laughs> it's not paired to the phone though <laughs> it's wirelessly charging through a panel in the wall that they installed in secret from the future Frank goes to speak with Leo at a bar, and Leo says that he has a line on a solid investment. He offers to put Frank's money toward it. Frank assumes he's talking about drugs, but Leo corrects him that he means shopping malls. Frank lets Leo know how unhappy he is with his current situation. The second he's signed up with these people, the cops are all over him. They're bugging his house, they're bugging his car, and he wants Leo to take care of it. I like how he describes the bugs in his car. I found the one in the bumper. That's the one they wanted me to find. Yeah. And then I found the one, the one in the th- wheel well. Yeah. That they didn't want me to find. <laughs> Leo says he will take care of it. Leo follows up the promise by asking if Frank has been trying to adopt. Apparently word has made it back to him. And Frank is suspicious of Leo's omniscience. He claims that he heard it through the grapevine because Barry told somebody who told him. But I don't think Barry's walking around talking about this either. Yeah. Leo reminds Frank that he can always come to Leo with his problems. So presumably Leo doesn't have a bunch of kids in a box somewhere that he can just hand out like dinner mints. Uh, apparently that's exactly what's going on though. Yep. He's like, I-, I got kids. Leo tells Frank that he can get him a kid and not just any kid, any kind of kid. Fat kids, skinny kids, kids like Clorox. <laughs> <laughs> Fat kids, skinny kids. Even kids with chicken pox love hot dogs. You state your model. Black, brown, yellow, and white. Boy or girl? Where from? A couple of ladies. They got babies to sell. Which to me means he's also running prostitution. Right. Frank says he wants a boy and Leo grants him his wish right then and there. Frank is overjoyed by this development and he gets in a manic little tickle fight with Leo before leaving the bar. Yeah. <laughs> he's it, like, aww, and they're like hugging and like joshing each other. Yeah, I was like, oh my god, are you guys best friends now? Yeah. Or what? We cut to Frank alone in his regular bar that he owns taking a phone call and then rushing out the door frank and jesse moved down a hospital corridor and at first i thought that leo had already hooked them up with a kid forgetting that the child was coming from a black market source and probably wouldn't be released to them from a hospital turns out they're here to see okla who's just been released from prison frank jokes with okla that he's got a car full of prostitutes downstairs for him and they should get going he introduces okla to jesse Okla motions for Frank to get close so he can whisper something in his ear, and as soon as he gets there, Okla is coding. Machines blare as Okla dies. It's cold blue. You'll have to leave. No. You'll have to leave. Frank. Doctors rush in and push Frank back from the table as they try to restart Okla's heart. Apparently, just after he was officially released by the judge, he collapsed on the steps of the courthouse. It seems like he was just waiting to be free so that he could die outside of the system. Frank and Jesse wait in the lobby for the results of the hospital's efforts to save Okla, and the doctor returns to inform him that Okla has passed away. Apparently, Khan had a line in response, but instead he just angrily stares down the actor playing the doctor, and the guy looks genuinely horrified by the glare. (laughs) We cut elsewhere to Jesse waiting outside an apartment building when a woman comes out and hands her a child wrapped in blankets. She walks to Frank's car, and they drive away, just holding the baby in the front seat, like you did. None of them are probably wearing seatbelts. No. I'm also kind of horrified. I'm, there's probably not a child in this blanket, which is why it's all wrapped up. But, like, yeah. you cannot see a baby in the blanket. I'm like, you really shouldn't have blankets over their face. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. And th- and the at the very least, take the cigarette out of the kid's mouth. <laughs> 
1981. Jesus Christ. Give him some quaaludes. Maybe 100? 100 ludes? We cut to them in a Chinese restaurant, and a waiter compliments the beautiful baby. He asks the name, but Jesse says they haven't picked one out yet. Frank is obviously still upset about Oakless' death, and Jesse offers to name their child after him. A smile crosses Frank's face. Oakless' real name was David. Dave. She seems to like the name, and Frank calls the waiter back over to their table to announce the newly christened child. I was kind of hoping that the waiter would be wearing a name tag that said David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just think, oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> he tells them it's a good name. We cut back to Frank's buddy Sam, who has developed the tool for the job. He instructs Frank to light the end of a metal rod with a blowtorch and then get away from it. It looks like a thermite torch, like the one MacGyver used in Season 1, Episode 7, The Last Stand. <laughs> mm-hmm. It basically blasts a beam that can cut straight through thick metal sheets. Apparently, this is a real thing. It's called an oxy lance or a thermal lance, but in the film, they call it a burning bar. We get a quick scene of Barry's bug picking up the code word to deactivate the fifth alarm system. I'd be curious how, because I feel like when he first asked for this system to be made, he said it was going to be 17 hours of cutting, something like that. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm misremembering. Oh, no, I think I think that was what they thought it was going to take for like the whole job. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, either way, I was like, how long does this actually take to, to melt an entire door off? And yeah, if it's 17 hours, you many, need so much fuel. Well, that's what I was going to say. How many sticks did they bring into this place? Yeah, because it's basically like magnesium and and like... And it, iron oxide yeah. is the official chemical formula. But uh, also, I, I have a lot of problems with this cutting scene, which we'll get to when we yeah. get there. But I didn't know if you were going to say about the bugging and the alarm where he gets two pieces of information. He gets... He gets the code word, but also that they are moving the diamonds very soon. Oh, I didn't. I didn't even catch that detail. Yeah, that. Uh, I think that that's why when Barry calls him, says we're on. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because uh, they, they have are, to do it right now. They got to do it right now. Ah, oh, I missed that. Um, what is this place? Like, it's just it's some random building where two guys sit in front of a vault all day. Um, given the furniture and the layout, I think it's a. A very private, exclusive jewelry sampling, or like like a tasting almost, like mm-hmm. where you come in as like, would you like to look at these diamonds? And they only have enough like tables set up for like, by appointment only. Correct. You just come in and you sit down and you look at merchandise and you leave. Yeah, because there's there's it's a room with no windows. Yeah. So there's no way to get in or out of this room at all, and and there's just a couple of tables and chairs set up where you would just sit and they would okay. show you the merchandise. That that makes more sense because I'm just like, do two guys just sit here all day to guard a vault that's basically impenetrable? Like, do you remember the MacGyver episode where they introduced the no. Mickey Carpenter character? <laughs> Actually, I, I think I do. <laughs> uh, and they have a giant safe that's just full of diamonds, and like hundreds of people in the city keep their diamonds in this same vault mm. because it's the most high tech best vault in the city. Yeah. But of course it's going to become a target (laughs) because that's stupid. Let's put all of our eggs in this fancy basket. (laughs) Which one of you let the bird out? (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) That was uh, uh, casino owner Jack Catlin in the Virgin Islands from season one, episode five, played by Vernon Wells. He uh, he keeps his diamonds in a safe in a penthouse suite. And when MacGyver takes it, he lets the bird out of the cage, and he thinks that his henchman did it, but MacGyver did it. Okay. The alarm blares. Mexico. We're at thanks. Ideally, this password would change every time they use it, but for the purposes of this film, it seems to always be Mexico. Frank gets that phone call at the bar from Barry, and he says, we're on. Yeah, I was sure that this was going to be the thing that tripped them up, because I'm like, you listened once to this password because like i would have i would have had a system where it changes daily according to some sort of pattern or like Mm -hmm. mexico monday and then (laughs) taco tuesday (laughs) everything is mexico related for some reason (laughs) but yeah but like i mean it could be a system like you know hurricanes like we're going through the alphabet right right right. yeah that's what i would think that it would that it would change like maybe not even daily like every six hours or something like that. or every time you use it yeah like you have to, every time you've used the password, you have that to switch sense. it to the next yeah. one. That's the way to do it. Yeah. But no, it's just Mexico all the time. Leaving the bar, Frank is pulled over by the police for no reason. You bitch, Jagger! For what? Grab me out of the 
We cut to an interrogation room where Frank is being worked over by like five cops at the same time. He doesn't give an inch, and he continues trolling them the whole time they're beating on him. It's exactly the kind of scene he described in prison, and once they realize, as his fellow inmates did, that he doesn't care enough about himself to roll over and do their bidding, they give up. Frank will never pay these men just to do what he can do without them. Okay, fuck this guy. I'll tell you something. I'm going to be on your ass so much, you're going to get careless. And on that day, I'm going to be in that place. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the last place you want to be. Because <laughs> no matter what happens, I will never, ever take a pinch from a greasy motherfucker like you. you got it, Come on, they cut him loose but they keep their tail on him. Frank parks his car, and the cops wait for his next move. He walks into a bus depot and comes out the other side to get in a second waiting vehicle. When the cops see the tracker they planted on him in the interrogation room is moving again, they start to follow it, but it turns out that Frank put the tracker on a bus to Des Moines. Those cops <laughs> have a long night ahead of them. Mm -hmm. We cut to the rooftop of the building where the vault job lives. Frank is taking a circular saw to the rooftop cutting his way into an elevator shaft but at first he's literally just cutting through the gravel on the roof i was like you can sweep that away first you don't have to use the well, saw usually that. that stuff is uh tarred on so guess, it's maybe. just all one piece they start bashing big chunks of the roof down into the elevator shaft and apparently james Conn fucked his hand up real good swinging this crowbar around on the roof yeah i mean they they are really going at it yeah i mean i get it that it's an empty building and they're you know dozens of stories up in the air so no one's going to hear anything but they, they're really not being careful about how loud they are up here well and that's i was confused about that too because maybe i misunderstood because i thought some of them were uh some of the some of the alarms were triggered by sound i think if they were their their alarms that they bypassed with the electrical adjustments right. that they make yeah but they saw it into the roof before they that's bypassed true. anything that is true <laughs> But it does, the stuff doesn't make a sound until it gets to the bottom floor where it hits the elevator. They're lucky the elevator wasn't higher in the shaft. You don't think that it makes a sound when you drill through a roof? No. <laughs> when I do it, it doesn't make a sound. Because when I do it, it's rhetorical. I've never done it. Is that what rhetorical means? <laughs> Imaginary? <laughs> Frank leans into the hole and uses a tool to open up some conduit to access the building's electrical system. They test the voltage on various wires inside to determine which ones are phone lines and which ones are important. They patch in their own power source to the line and cut the wires so that they won't interrupt the circuit later. Frank uses a massive push drill to get into the building, and when the alarm goes off in the vault lobby, he recites the static code word into a phone to disable it. Frank walks right up to the vault. Upstairs, Barry confirms that all the electrical lines are maintaining consistent voltage. In the vault room, Barry, Frank, and Joseph ignite the burning bar. I'm assuming that where Joseph should be, that this third guy is actually just like a fire marshal on set to make sure that they don't burn this building down because they're all completely covered anyway. And the guy's standing there with a fire extinguisher the whole time in case the lance gets too hot. Yeah, but, cause, Well, cause, I think it's it's whatever's coming off of it. He's trying right. not to burn the building down. But yeah. I, But I think the same thing that they're doing in the scene they're doing on set and i think oh, they have yeah. a professional keeping it from burning down yeah. yeah um so this was part of my problem with the scene in this room with no windows and, and so no doors, doors. <laughs> is this haunted room actually stretching no you're just passing out from smoke inhalation <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah the, the the combination of the chemical reaction of the lance the melting of the metal and the constant CO2 expulsion from the fire extinguishers. Yeah. I was like, this room is not going to be habitable for very long. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there are doors. There's, <laughs> there's no windows, but there are doors. That's how they got in here. It's not <laughs> funny guy. unless I say the whole line from the ride. You have to say it in Paul Freeze's voice. <laughs> the thing works like a charm, though, melting right through the vault wall. It's honestly terrifying because it's throwing splashes of liquid hot metal all over the room. Luckily, they aren't after cash, like that scene in RoboCop. You burned the fucking money! I had to blow the door, what do you want? <laughs> the third helper is just following the blaze along with a fire extinguisher the whole time to minimize the spread of flames. The footage is gorgeous, too. They yank open this small square patch that they've cut in this vault wall, 
and Barry crawls in faster than I would have. Oh, yeah. No, that really bothered me because I'm just like... <laughs> this is going to be hot for an he, hour after you yeah, do that. Yeah, and he stepped... I think he stepped on the door as he's walking through it. I'm just like, uh-uh, that thing is still molten hot. You're going to yeah. melt your shoe to that thing. But he starts dumping their prize into a bag inside the vault when outside Frank peels off his protective gear and takes a seat in a chair. He lights a cigarette and relaxes because his part of the job is done. <laughs> I was worried. I was like, oh, don't smoke in this room. <laughs> the alarm <full> of- <laughs> goes off. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, we set this room on fire for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> they, do, they do cover it with a... Uh, foam right yeah yeah so they they did they did account for that but i i, I kind of have a hard time believing that a fire uh, alarm covered in spray foam is enough well it's to not stop just spray it. foam it's like that that firewall like that hard cock stuff mm. that well it is but it is spray spray it's expanding spray foam, foam. Yeah. but it would be airtight that's I, the whole point i guess we cut to the next day frank jesse and david walk along the beach together well i guess david's not walking he's being carried he's a baby <laughs> Barry is here too, and Frank tells him that they pick up their cut tomorrow. Barry chases after his girlfriend, Marie, tackling her hard into the surf. Too hard, really. <laughs> At home, they tuck in David and move to the bedroom to make love, and the next day, Frank heads to Leo's home to collect his share of the score, but it's way light, maybe a tenth of what it should be. Leo says he put the rest into that shopping center investment that he was talking about without asking. Frank informs Leo that their work together has concluded. And Leo tells him a bit about the next job. <laughs> I thought we had this good thing. Plus, I got a major score in Palm Beach for you in six weeks. You talking to me or somebody else walking in this room? What's that supposed to mean? It means you are dreaming. This is payday. It is over. Leo takes credit for Frank's car, home, and child, expecting that a continued partnership is the least Frank can offer in return. I thought you'd come around. What the hell is this? What? Where is gratitude? Where is my end? Leo blatantly refuses to give Frank his money, and Frank gives him 24 hours to come up with it. That night, we see Frank out driving, and we cut to Ataglia's henchman beating the shit out of Barry, asking for Frank's whereabouts. Frank arrives at his car lot, and he calls out for Barry. The henchman and Barry are in the back room here, and they can hear Frank calling for him. Answer! Frank! But instead of doing what they want, Barry informs Frank what's happening. You shut up! And Barry takes a shotgun blast in the belly and dies on the lot. They knock Frank unconscious, and he wakes up with Leo standing over him. They show Frank his dead friend and tell Frank what he has coming to him if he doesn't cooperate. Leo knows the kind of guy Frank claims to be, the kind that doesn't give a shit about anything, but he accuses Frank of faking it. He starts listing things in Frank's life that he clearly cares about, and then makes nasty threats against all of it. Your kid's mine because I bought it. You got him on loan, he is leased, you are renting him. I'll whack out your whole family. People will be eating them for lunch tomorrow in their wimpy burgers and not know it. He warns Frank against making any further demands with regard to his pay. Frank will do what Leo says when Leo says to do it, and he will work until he can't anymore. Uh, and then they drop Barry's body into some kind of liquid. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming it's it's some kind of dissolving agent, but it seems to be like overflowing and going all over the place. It would be and, super dangerous. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't even really know what this facility is. It looks yeah. like some kind of laundry almost. It doesn't look like they're on the anywhere near the car lot anymore. I don't yeah. know where they brought him. But you do hear like almost a sizzling sound, but it could be the Tangerine Dream soundtrack yeah. coming back in, but it does sound like there's sort of a fizzing sound on the track that might be this body dissolving. Frank cleans himself up in a bathroom and bashes his head against the mirror. So, right, did you guys notice that right at the end of the shot with the mirror, there's like a freeze frame? The, no. The, there's a couple of weird random freeze frames in this movie. Yeah, so it, like right at the end of that shot, so like he he kind of like hits his head against the mirror and then glances up at himself in the mirror and I think that they they wanted to hold on him looking at himself like probably longer than they had footage for, it, but it just freezes. I backed it up a couple times and I'm like that's really I didn't really weird. Catch that. that when the camera's locked down, I don't notice that stuff as much. That's that's good catch. He turns on a light in his bedroom, and he makes a phone call to Joseph. Joseph, get over here right away. You going on a trip? Jesse is awoken by the call. Frank tells her that she and David are leaving. 
that this life was never going to work. He tells her to prepare to leave immediately, but not to pack anything. He gives her $410,000 in cash, and he says Joseph will help set them up somewhere new. She's trying to talk him out of abandoning his family, while he talks over her, explaining that she has to pay Joseph tens of thousands of dollars each month for the first three months, presumably as protection money or like they're employing him to keep people away from the family. Frank tells her over and over that he is throwing her out, but she finally hears him when he gets loud. As they get into a car out front, David calls out for his dada, and he's loaded into the car and whisked off into the night. Amazingly, Leo didn't already have people watching Frank's house in case he tried something crazy tonight. I feel like they for sure would have sent at least one guy to watch this house tonight. Yeah, absolutely. We see Frank leave the house and pull away in his car, and moments later, the entire home explodes in a fireball. Apparently, they built a house facade in the front yard of a real house for this scene, but as we know from Caddyshack and Graydon Clark's The Return in 1980, they always used too many explosives, and the resulting blast damaged the real home and fractured the foundation. Oh, no. Forcing the owners who'd been staying at a hotel during the production to demolish the home when they returned. Oh, no. Next, Frank heads over to his bar and loads that with explosives before driving away and letting it explode in his wake. The bar is also a real location, but wasn't destroyed by the blast, surviving still today. If you're going to build a facade anyways, why put it anywhere near a regular house? Because you don't want to build all the other houses on the street. Like, there's some houses that are further back on the property. Yeah, but the angles in which they show the explosion are pretty tight. Yeah. That's true. I just, it seems wholly unnecessary and, and just freaking matte painting with some tr- extra trees just and blow up the real house guys <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying seems unnecessary to do it anywhere near an actual building yeah finally frank heads to his car lot and dumps gasoline everywhere and burns it all to the ground apparently two thousand people stood around to watch the car lot explode despite sub-freezing temperatures at 4 a.m in a chicago winter yeah i so would you not have well, the building doesn't even explode. Yeah, no. <laughs> that was my. I read that and I read that too, and I was just like, "Wait, did it did it explode?" And I kept. I no, went back. it's just a fire. It was like I went. I kept thinking I missed something, and I was like, "No, it it just the cars. There are just a couple of cars on fire." Yeah, there's not much to see here. Yeah, but to answer your question, even if it did explode, no, I would not be out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's sub zero temperatures just to watch a building explode. I can I can Google that. It, and they could probably, Google it, too. It probably wouldn't be Sub-Zero for long. The nice burn of the building on your face. There you go. Sub-Zero. Why is the building on my face? Scorpion. <laughs> Frank uses a Slim Jim to break into Leo's home. No, not that kind of a Slim Jim, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Leo and Itaglia sit together in his living room, and Itaglia heads to the kitchen, where we last saw Frank hiding. I do like that these two are here hanging out together. And he's like, oh, you want some milk? <laughs> I'm going to go get a drink. <laughs> it's like, why are you in the same house? I really wanted that to be like the last light of the movie. He wants some milk. <laughs> it practically is. It is, but he responds to it. But yeah. he's just like, no, I'm good. But And I think that is the last spoken line. But yeah. I just, it's great. <laughs> Other than like, wah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My favorite word. <laughs> Ataglia gets a drink out of the fridge when suddenly Frank slams the fridge door on him and then bashes him repeatedly with the butt of his gun until he collapses unconscious on the kitchen floor. I feel like I would have just started with the gun and not waste your time with a giant plastic refrigerator door. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I feel like if he was trying to be stealthy, he wasn't. Yeah, he did a terrible Well, he job. started stealthy, but I feel like at the point at which you need to, at, at, at the point at which you decide not to be stealthy, you need to be quick. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's you, what you have wasn't. the advantage hiding behind this refrigerator door. Just wait for him to close it and then hit him three times with the butt. Knock three times on his ceiling if you want him unconscious. <laughs> his ceiling his being, ceiling of course, his, the top yeah, of his head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so wouldn't it be the roof? It's a song, Richard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's an old song. You know old songs, right? Do I? I don't know. Maybe not. Twice on the pipe. If the answer is no. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the rest of the song in this situation. Is it pipes? Is Isn't that it? how it goes? Yeah, is this a twice, song about murdering twice people? On the, yeah. yeah. Knock three times on the ceiling if you want me. Twice on the pipes if the answer is no. Is that not the lyrics? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine wh- what the guy's pipes are. <laughs> That's, Man, you have John to imagine that music. hard? <laughs> well, there's there's a wind one. <laughs> 
Frank moves around the house, clearing rooms one at a time. In a cutaway, we see that Leo heard the kitchen commotion and has armed himself. Eventually, they find each other in a sitting room somewhere, and Leo leaps out to fire on Frank, but Frank gets him twice, and Leo misses. Leo reaches for his gun to get one last shot, and Frank finishes him off. Yeah, that's uh, two for two headshots in movies. Yeah. So, come on, hard country. <laughs> you better have it's a not, it's not gonna bloody headshot. A tag Leo regains consciousness and makes a run for it. Frank chases him out into the yard where Dennis Farina starts firing on him. Frank kills a tag Leo and then Farina hits Frank with a shotgun blast, knocking him off his feet. Frank twists around on the ground and takes two final shots at Farina, killing him. And then he stands up and unstraps his bulletproof vest before walking down the sidewalk off into the night. Yeah. So uh, when Antaglia goes down, it's a really weird looking shot. And it it almost looks like he's comped into a shot. Yeah. They definitely weren't doing that at that time. Yeah. But I agree. The speed that he's falling down at looks wrong. Yeah. It, it's... It, it, it was so bizarre. I went back a couple of times because, again, when Robert Pronsky gets shot in the head, they do another one of those freeze frames. Yeah. Um, it's it's real quick. There's like one or two extra frames of his head going back before it splatters. But then when Antaglia goes back, falls backwards, it was like, that looked really weird. It did. Like he's not in the scene. But he definitely was. Um, our writer-director here was Michael Mann. We mentioned a lot of his TV work, and he followed this up with mostly films, although he was an EP on Miami Vice, for which he also wrote, starting in 1984. In 83, he directed The Keep, and later Manhunter, Last of the Mohicans, Heat, The Insider, Ali, and eventually the feature film reboot of Miami Vice starring Jamie Foxx and Colin Farrell. Out of all of those films, Last of the Mohicans seems so out of yeah. his like norm. That's true. Um, He also made Public Enemy with Johnny Depp, but we don't have to talk about that. The novel was written by Frank Hoheimer. He was in prison during the production. (laughs) I can only assume for some kind of home invasion crime. Producer Jerry Bruckheimer. uh, Last year he produced American Gigolo and Defiance, and he later produces Flashdance, Top Gun, Bad Boys, The Rock, Con Air, Armageddon, Pirates of the Caribbean, and National Treasure. A lot of great stuff. He's also an EP on every version of CSI, the first of which stars William Peterson, who showed up as the bartender in this film. The music here was provided by Tangerine Dream. Before this, they had scored William Friedkin's The Sorcerer, and they came back to Man for The Keep, but also scored Risky Business, Firestarter, Vision Quest, Red Heat, Legend, and Near Dark. Cinematographer Donald E. Thorin. This is his first DP credit. What? Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. Yeah, coming out of the gate strong. Every shot is gorgeous, and this is this guy's first movie. Amazing. W- with some of his shots, like during the driving scenes with the Tangerine Dream soundtrack, it seems like a, like a cyberpunk kind of movie. Yeah. It looks like it could have been shot today. Like It looks yeah. like so modern in, in the sensibilities, mm-hmm. and the the purples and the blues are gorgeous, and all these shimmering reflections at night. It's just, it's lovely. Uh, He followed this with An Officer and a Gentleman, Against All Odds, Purple Rain, The Golden Child, Midnight Run, and Tango and Cash. So a lot of really solid 80s titles. Yeah, Midnight Run's great. Editor Dove Hennig uh, didn't recognize many credits before this, but Dove also cut The Keep, Manhunter, and Mohicans. Oh, and Heat for Man, as well as Overboard, Under Siege, The Fugitive, The Crow, Street Fighter, and Dark City. Nice. James Kahn was Frank. We saw him last year as Thomas Hacklin Jr. in Hide in Plain Sight. He's obviously Sonny Corleone in The Godfather. He's Dr. Scurvy in The Dark Backward. He's Mr. Henry in Bottle Rocket, an unofficial sequel to this film. And he's Elf's dad in Elf. But more recently, he was Flint Lockwood's father in the Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs films. That's funny. We had mentioned uh, Jess and New Girl, which is Zoe Deschanel. And Zoe Deschanel's in Elf with James Kahn. That's true. That's true. There you go. I did it. (laughs) <laughs> you did it. Tuesday Weld was Jesse. Speaking of Jesse, she was Kate in Serial last year. She's also Carol in Once Upon a Time in America, Mrs. Pendergrast, Robert Duvall's wife in Falling Down. Uh, we'll see her in Author Author for season three. Willie Nelson was Okla. He's a famous musician. We had him in Honeysuckle Rose last year. He shows up as himself in The Spy Who Shagged Me and later as Uncle Jesse Duke in the Dukes of Hazard film. Jim Belushi played Barry. He's in Red Heat. Canine. 
He provided voices on the Mighty Ducks and Ah! Real Monsters animated series, but he's probably best known for his long-running series According to Jim. <laughs> I always laugh when I hear that title now. Because According the, to Yim? According to Yim, every time the drivers <laughs> would come in and pick up the tapes from the from the vault at Laser. I'm here say, for According to Yim. Picking up According to Yim. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he was best known for being John Belushi's yeah. brother. <laughs> uh, that's what I just said. <laughs> best known for the long-running series According to Jim, if not just as John Belushi's brother. <laughs> You beat me to it. Robert Prosky played Leo. He has TV and stage work before this, but this was his first credited feature film appearance. He later shows up in Christine, Broadcast News, The Great Outdoors, but my favorite parts from him are from 1993 in Last Action Hero and Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, Oh, yeah. I really liked him in, uh, obviously, The Natural, which is one of my favorite, where he plays the judge. Um, And he also came back for The Keep, which was Michael Mann's next film. Tom Signorelli played Ataglia. Uh, He also showed up last year in Hide in Plain Sight. Dennis Farina was Carl. He was a Chicago policeman at the time of filming this film. Hmm. He shows up for Michael Mann in Manhunter and later Midnight Run, Saving Private Ryan, Snatch, and Big Trouble. But more recently, he was the father of Jake Johnson's character on The New Girl. (laughs) How many times can we mention The New (laughs) Girl? (laughs) John Santucci played Urizzi. He was a career jewel thief and technical advisor on the film, and he later appeared in an episode of Miami Vice for Michael Mann. Gavin McFadden played Barexco. He came back to associate produce man's next film, The Keep. Barexco is the second cop with Urizzi that's getting frustrated when James Conn is like, I don't pay you guys anything. Go away. Chuck Adamson played Ansel. He was the creator of the Crime Story series for which Mann was a recurring writer. He also served as a technical advisor on Thief and later on Heat. Del Close played Mechanic Number 1. We barely see these guys, but... The first time Frank leaves his lot, we get a quick shot of three mechanics working in the garage. Right. Del Close is a giant in the improv comedy world. He probably got this part on account of having taught improv to John and James Belushi, but other students of his include almost all the founders of the Upright Citizens Brigade, all the white Ghostbusters, Ike Barinholtz, John Candy, J. Chandra Seekar, Stephen Colbert, Andy Dick, Rachel Dratch, Chris Farley, John Favreau, Tina Fey, Neil Flynn, Dave Koechner, Adam McKay, Tim Meadows, Jerry Miner, Bob Odenkirk, Gilda Radner, Andy Richter, Horatio Sands, Amy Sedaris, Dave Thomas, Vince Vaughn, and George Went, among countless others. When Del Close passed away, he left his skull to Chicago's Goodman Theater to play Yorick in its Hamlet productions, <laughs> but apparently this was not possible for whatever reason. A skull was apparently donated, but it was not Del Close's. What? The executor of his will admitted to buying the skull from a medical supply company. I'm assuming the reasoning for that is that you can't just tell the hospital, oh, can you cut off his head and clean the skull (laughs) and then give me the skull back? There there are some strict laws around human remains. and and, But it seems like she did have a real skull that she donated, but maybe if you buy it secondhand enough, then it's okay. Well, just because you bought it from a medical supply company didn't mean it was a real skull. Well, the... They knew that it was a skull, but oh. the, they could tell that it wasn't Del Close's because, one, when Del passed away, he didn't have any teeth because of the disease he died from, and the skull had teeth, hmm. and also it had markings as if it had been autopsied, which Del Close was not autopsied. Hmm. And they held a wake for him before he passed away that Bill Murray hosted, and so it was like a whole party that they had with him. Sorry, the the donating of the skull reminded me of Mystery Men. And when she has it in the bowling ball? Yeah, because there was like... Do I to understand you inserted your father's head into that ball for bowling? He's like, nah, guy at the pro shop did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Del Close shows up in 1972's Beware the Blob as Hobo with an Eye Patch. He's also an English teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and he narrated the Upright Citizens Brigade series in the late 90s. John Kapalos played Mechanic Number 3. This was his first feature film, but he comes back as a John Hughes regular. He's Rudy in 16 Candles. He's Carl the janitor in The Breakfast Club. He plays the dinosaur in Weird Science. More recently, we just saw him as Jack Ruby in season two of The Umbrella Academy. William Peterson played Katz and Jammer, bartender. He's the lead investigator of the original CSI series. He's also Will Graham in Manhunter and Pat Garrett in Young Guns 2. Nancy Santucci was the waitress during the diner scene with Jesse, and that's actually the wife of the technical advisor who was a career jewel thief. Mm. <laughs> he got his wife a part of the movie. Nathan Davis played Grossman, that's Sam, who invented the lightsaber. Uh, he was just Mario in On the Right Track, and he's Kane in Poltergeist 3, 
and the grandfather in Holes. J.J. Saunders played Doctor. That's the doctor who got scared of James Caan. He was the mayor in Armed and Dangerous. He plays Moving Man number one in Beetlejuice, who's being very careless with uh, the Dietz art. Yeah. Uh, He's a judge in Mac and Me, and he plays Sheriff Black in Tammy and the T-Rex. So he's got a couple Stuart Raffle credits. Karen Berger was Ruthie. Uh, Only one more credit as Chloris in Rockula 1990. But lately she's been racking up credits writing TV movies for the Hallmark Channel. Michael Paul Chan played the waiter at the Chinese restaurant. He's Data's father in Goonies. He plays a banker in the Wish Child MacGyver episode. He's Mr. Lee in Falling Down. He's Harold in the Joy Luck Club and an executive in Batman Forever. More recently, he was Judge Ping on Arrested Development, and he recently returned to MacGyver for an episode of the reboot series. Uh, I know him mostly from the TV show The Closer. Oh, okay. Oh, when, when you said uh, Data's dad, I was like, from TV. Star D- Trek. Didn't he play his own dad? <laughs> Am I misremembering that? <laughs> no, he doesn't play the the doctor that invents them does, does he, he not who, who plays the the doctor that invents data from data, star trek data and uh brent spiner it yeah brent spiner? I, I was like yeah. he plays his own dad how could it how could that that's not him <laughs> which, which is which is really great when there's an episode with lore brent spiner as data and dr soon where they're all in a scene together yeah <laughs> Patty Ross played Marie. That's the girlfriend who gets tackled hard into the beach. She was the head nurse in the Farrelly Brothers Three Stooges movie. She's a judge in That's My Boy, the one where Adam Sandler is uh, Andy Samberg's father right. because he like had a kid with his teacher when he was younger. Um, and last year she was Scary Locker Lady in the Netflix movie Hubie Halloween, mm. which I never saw that one. It was it was better than I expected. I laughed quite a bit. <laughs> Does that character ring a bell? Scary Locker Lady? No, I don't know what okay. that is. <laughs> uh, those are all the credits I had for this one. I like this movie a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a thumbs up. Yeah, it's a thumbs up. The story works great. The ending is phenomenal. And like we said, the cinematography yeah. is Fabulous. gorgeous the whole way Fabulous through. Fabulous filming. And the soundtrack complements the cinematography perfectly. Mm-hmm. You could not ask for a more perfect uh, pairing of, yeah. of those two elements. Yeah. It's good performances all around. Uh, yeah. I, I I mean, maybe a little long, but that's, that, that's a nitpicky thing. Like, as like... It, I, I certainly didn't ever feel like yeah. it was too long. Right. I, but I, but you saying that, like, I didn't feel like it was long. But also, what would you cut? Like, I don't really feel like there's anything that I would particularly cut. No, I... Well, I, the scene at the gravel pit, I still don't get. Oh, that's a different <laughs> movie. Never mind. Um, if I had to cut something, I guess I would actually cut some of the vault cutting. Um, only because it does go on for a while, like, but it, it feels natural to what they would be going through yeah i honestly felt like that scene went faster than i expected it to Um, when they pulled the panel out i was like oh they already done with the cutting i thought they were gonna like linger on this for a while more there was a couple of times where there was like an odd insert where it it looked like they were cutting like fake plastic but i think what was happening is they had to stop down the the iris so much because it was so bright that oh that it, it made it look dim well no that it just it because now now the there's the light is only coming from like these glowing hot objects Mm -hmm. and it gives it this really weird kind of look where it doesn't look real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Like if you ever watch like footage of nuclear explosions when they, when they have to close that iris down really, really small on something and everything just has like this. uh, It almost looks like a, like stop motion, like like mushroom tilt shift. Exactly. Like a tilt shift photography. Um, And so, uh, like I, I feel like some of those inserts could have been cut only because I wasn't really sure what I was seeing. Yeah, uh, I did like when they were inside the vault watching the cutting. Yeah, happen with the from sparks the flying at the camera. Um, but no, but it, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I just, I, I, I didn't think it felt. I guess, I guess I did kind of feel like it felt long, but <laughs> I couldn't. I can't think of anything to cut. It's just a solid movie. Yeah, I'm like I said, I'm nitpicking it. Yeah, because I got no real flaws in this movie. Yeah, I mean it's it's. Definitely by far the best film we've watched this year. Yeah, so definitely three thumbs up for this one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, do you guys know where it's going letterbox wise? I wanted to put this at the top of the list because I think it's the best movie that, in terms of filmmaking that we've sure. watched this year. Um, but I'm going to put it at number two just below Scanners because, you know, heads exploding and stuff. Okay. Uh, I also have it at number two just below Scanners. 
uh, because heads exploding and stuff. Because heads exploding and stuff. Also, computers <laughs> exploding and stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually put it just above scanners. Um, I love heads exploding, but the filmmaking here is phenomenal, and I feel like there's there's no part of this that is that is less than perfect. Whereas I feel like scanners feels a little cheap in places. Yeah, no, for sure it does. But in terms of like, like I said, this is this is a great movie and i have no problems with it whatsoever but which one am i gonna want to watch again right scanners yeah uh but being above scanners doesn't put it in first on my list it that puts it in third place it's just under modern romance so it's between modern romance and scanners (laughs) wait oh wait what's the top of your list amy oh yeah wow amy even going back and pulling the clips to edit like, the episode i was getting teary. really emotional okay, wow <laughs> i was like really connecting with that movie uh i don't know man it was powerful for me yeah no i i, I liked amy a lot I yeah no problems with that movie either. <laughs> <laughs> well richard had to watch it on a potato so <laughs> yeah the fart nose was for me yeah <laughs> um but yeah i i loved this movie um we can only sing its praises for so long i yeah. suppose um i think that's everything for thief if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share we are vintage video pod on twitter facebook instagram and letterboxd or as i said before you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year we can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com because this is our first episode of the month again i wanted to remind our listeners about our patreon campaign vintage video will always be free to listen to but if it's worth it to you a donation as small as a buck a month is greatly appreciated our five dollar patreon tier includes a shout out on the show a monthly exclusive episode reviewing a title from the 70s and a hand in choosing each month's film as an added bonus this year we are starting to fill in some of the blanks from last year with about 20 minisodes reviewing titles that didn't make the cut from 1980 for june our five dollar patrons are choosing between the following seven titles carnal knowledge written by jules pfeiffer and directed by mike nichols Carnal Knowledge is a comedy drama about the sexual exploits of a pair of college roommates from the 40s through the 70s, starring Jack Nicholson, Art Garfunkel, Anne Margaret, Candace Bergen, and Rita Moreno. Clute, Alan J. Pacula's neo-noir crime thriller that teams up a detective, played by Donald Sutherland, with a prostitute, played by Jane Fonda, to solve a missing persons case. McCabe and Mrs. Miller, another prostitute team-up film robert altman's revisionist western about gambler warren Beatty teaming up with prostitute julie christie to face off against encroaching corporations the anderson tapes an adaptation of the first book of author lawrence sanders edward x delaney series immediately preceding the first deadly sin which we saw adapted last year starring frank sinatra the first installment is directed by Sidney lamette and stars Sean Connery, Diane Cannon, Martin Balsam, and Alan King. It also marks the feature film debut of a young Christopher Walken. Nice. The Million Dollar Duck, regular Disney director Vincent McAvity's comedy about a family who acquires a duck that lays golden eggs. It stars Dean Jones, Sandy Duncan, and Joe Flynn. They Might Be Giants, Anthony Harvey's comedy mystery about a psychiatric patient, played by George C. Scott, who believes himself to be Sherlock Holmes, placed in the care of a doctor played by joanne woodward who by coincidence happens to be named watson Mm. and willy wonka and the chocolate factory about a young boy who wins a contest to tour the chocolate factory of a reclusive slave master and one by one his fellow (laughs) contest winners are condemned to death for violating factory guidelines (laughs) each of which will be celebrating their 50th anniversaries this coming june did you write that one yourself or did you take that one from I write somewhere? all of them. I'm just saying there's you know that there's that thing that goes around the internet where oh, they're like describe a movie poorly or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I didn't know if it was one of those. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's close <laughs> enough to one of those. <laughs> if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, you can find our campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. If not, I hope you'll at least do us the honor of continuing to listen. We also have a Discord now. Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at vintagevideopodcast.com slash discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Hard Country, which IMDb describes like so. Ambitious young Jody wants more out of life than the small Texas country town she lives in has to offer. Jody realizes that in order to pursue her dreams, she will have to leave Texas and move to the big city. However... Her shiftless factory worker boyfriend, Kyle, wants to stay in Texas. I don't think I'm going to get my head shot in this movie. (laughs) I don't think so. We leave you now with a trailer for Hard Country. 
I've been 